Hi there. Uh, my name is Hassan Salam. I'm professor of obstetric and gynecology in Alexandria University in Egypt, and today I'm going to talk to you about assisted reproduction. Uh, now, uh, this presentation forms uh, part four of a series of uh, four parts presentation uh, on the management of the infertile couple. We uh, spoke before uh, about the male factors infertility, the ovarian factor, then all the other factors, the cervical, the tubal, the uterine, the peritoneal factor, and unexplained infertility. And now it's time to talk about assisted reproduction. And when we talk about assisted reproduction, we mean really three big things, either in vitro fertilization or intrasatic injection, ICSI, or uh, intrauterine insemination, IUI. But we should not forget two other uh, procedures, which are the uh, GIFT, tubal uh, gamete intrafalopian transfer, and also uh, zygote intrafalopian transfer, uh, ZIFT. So how did it all start? Well, uh, today, of course, we have about 8 million babies born about, uh, from the techniques of IVF and the, the related techniques. And in this picture, we can see uh, Professor Robert Edwards and uh, uh, Mr. Patrick Stepto and Jean Purdy, actually, uh, holding the first baby, uh, Louise Brown, on the 25th of uh, July of 1978, uh, uh, when the first uh, IVF baby was born. But how did it start, as I say? Now, it started by Mr. Stepto, who was a consultant uh, obstetrician gynecologist in Oldham, a city near Manchester in the uh, Midlands. Uh, he went to Paris to learn the technique of laparoscopy, uh, this new technique at that time. And the leader of the technique was Professor Raoul Palmer, as you can see him uh, here in the upper photo. Uh, and in fact, when Mr. Stepto came back from Paris, he actually uh, published a book called the Paroscopy in Gynecology, as you can see. Uh, but more importantly, he gave a talk at the Royal Society of Medicine in London. And the uh, British gynecologists uh, came to the lecture. They were not really impressed by this new technique. They said, how can you see everything from this uh, small uh, opening in the abdomen? Uh, in fact, um, at that time, uh, laparoscopy was still in its uh, beginning. Uh, there was no CCD camera, so the assistants could not see uh, what the surgeon uh, was doing. Uh, there was no automatic insufflator, so it was a problem always to keep the um, abdomen insufflated good enough. And there was no cold light, so you had to work quickly because the hot light could uh, produce desiccation of the, of the uh, tissues and so on. So the um, gynecologists were not very impressed. Uh, but at the end of uh, um, uh, the hall was uh, a young uh, um, uh, person, uh, Professor Robert Edwards. He's not professor at the time, but he was a scientist at uh, Cambridge. And uh, he approached Mr. Stepton and said, uh, well, when you are doing this laparoscopy, can you see a follicle about rupture? And Mr. Septu said, yes, uh, well, I think we can do this. He said, all right, why can't we collect the oocyte and fertilize it about, uh, uh, outside the body and put it back? We are doing this all the time in animals. So this is when uh, uh, the collaboration started around uh, the late uh, 60s, uh, 1968 or 69, after uh, Patrick Septu had come back from Paris. Uh, most of the patients uh, who were done at that time had blocked tubes, of course, and this is an example of what you could see when you did the laparoscopy at that time. So, uh, at that time, there was no any ultrasound. Actually, there was ultrasound, but you could not see the follicles by ultrasound. Ultrasound was in its primitive steps. So, how did uh, Mr. Steptoe and uh, Professor Edwards uh, do the first case, or the first cases? Well, they would admit, admit the patient to the hospital and then uh, measure the LH in urine uh, every uh, few hours, then every three hours. And when uh, the LH started to rise, this was considered a, uh, the defined rise, which was a rise of 50% uh, over the mean of the previous three readings. Anyway, so after a certain rise of the LH, uh, they would go, um, uh, Mr. Stato would go for the oocyte collection uh, or the oocyte retrieval. 28 hours after the, this uh, defined rise. Uh, but as I say, 
uh, everything was primitive as you can see here uh, this is Patrick Steptoe trying to uh, collect an old side and Jean Perdy uh, assisting him uh, they had this clumsy um, photographic instrument uh, to try and uh, photograph whatever they was doing but as you can see the assistant could not see what the main surgeon was doing so these patients, as I say, had blocked tubes, and what was done is that after uh, the uh, oocytes were collected, they were uh, fertilized outside the body and put back uh, from uh, through the cervix, as we can see uh, here. Well, step two and that was tried to uh, um, obtain some money from the Royal for the Medical Research Council uh, in the UK in order to pursue the work, but they uh, were not successful really, so they carried on doing this work um, um, on their own expenses, uh, starting from the 1968-69, um, and then finally when they succeed in 1978, Everybody was excited, and uh, today, of course, as I say, there are about 8 million babies born to the technique. In uh, 2010, Professor Edwards was rece received the Nobel Prize, but by that time, he was already in his Alzheimer, and uh, it was out up to his uh, wife uh, to receive uh, the prize, as you can see here, on the 10th of December 2010. But we were lucky. We celebrated with him 25 years of IVF in Alexandria in 2003. And we also celebrated with him 30 years of IVF in Alexandria in 2008, both times in the uh, Library of Alexandria, as you can see here. So let's start by talking about the stages of IVF. Now, uh, IVF uh, goes into stages. The first thing is we should sit down with the couple, uh, do the counselling and prepare the, co the couple for uh, the procedure. Then we would stimulate uh, the um, ovaries uh, by different stimulation protocols, which I'm going to discuss now. Then we would go for the oocyte retrieval. At the same time, the husband would uh, give us a sample of the semen, for which we will do our in vitro fertilization in the lab. And then when the embryos are ready, we would do the embryo transfer and, of course, do the luteal phase support. So what do we do uh, in our first step? Counseling and preparation of the IVF couple. Uh, well, there is an, uh, we sit with a couple to explain the indication why in their particular procedure they should have IVF, for example, or ICSI for that matter, or... Uh, uh, if they are going to have uh, pre implantation genetic uh, testing for any reason. So we explain the uh, indication, we explain the procedure, why do we need to do the basic test, how we are going to do the monitoring, how is the oocyte retrieval going to be done, how uh, are we are going to obtain the semen sample, if there is any testicular biopsy involved, and what's the difference between IVF, ICSI, and how do we do embryo transfers, and so on, if there is any freezing, and so on. Then we should explain to them the results because many patients think that this technique is 100% uh, successful. So they really have to understand that it is only uh, a probability. Uh, so this is an important part of the procedure, of the uh, counseling. Uh, and also we should explain the possible complications, particularly if the patient is, uh, has polycystic ovary syndrome. We should tell them that uh, there are uh, possible complications, um, very uh, unlikely, but present over in hyperstimulation syndrome, multiple pregnancy, infections, so on. Uh, if there is an issue about the weight, uh, if the, the lady has any allergies, uh, if we are uh, smoking alcohol, any drugs uh, uh, that the patient is taking, uh, if she has any current diseases, if she has any treatment. And of course, during the, this interview, we should really do some psychological assessment of the couple because some people, when they do not become pregnant, uh, they may end up having psychological problems and uh, people get depressed and some, uh, on rare occasions, people have committed suicide and things like this. And of course, um, sometimes it ends up by divorce and so on. So one has to uh, be uh, vigilant and take care of these uh, points. And finally, if there are any financials to be discussed. Uh, so having done the uh, counselling, then we start the actual procedure. So uh, we do laboratory uh, tests before starting, 
uh, and also there is a, a, a cervical swab to be done. Uh, we examined the ultrasound uh, and uh, we may like to do a trial embryo transfer or a dummy embryo transfer, a simulated embryo transfer, I should say, and then also if we need to do hysteroscopy uh, if indicated in some of the patients. So what are the initial laboratory tests? What uh, we do the uh, uh, test like uh, the anti-mullerian hormone or the FSH to uh, have an idea about the response of the patient. If we are expecting a patient who is a poor responder, for example, or an excessive responder, responder liable to ovarian hyperstimulation, we should do the semen analysis to see what procedure we're going to do. If it is a, a, a good semen analysis, we will do IVF, for example. But if the semen is not good, we will opt for ICSI from the beginning. Uh, we, there are some routine tests that need to be done, like CBC, urine analysis, uh, some tests for liver function and kidney function, and also to see if there's any uh, diabetes in the patients and uh, if there's any issue of coagulation, look at the um, platelet counts, for example. And then uh, we need to do some sexual tests for sexually transmitted diseases like hepatitis B and hepatitis C and HIV and syphilis. And this is important uh, because of the, the people who are working in the laboratory. And also, if we're going to do any freezing, we should uh, take our care not uh, to freeze, to mix uh, um, samples together. If we're going samples of semen or samples of uh, uh, sites or um, embryos. And uh, finally, if the lady has any disease, uh, diabetes or thyroid and so on, we may need to do some additional tests to make sure that uh, uh, she is uh, controlled. Um, at the same time, we do an initial ultrasound. And this is to exclude things like, for example, the presence of a polyp inside uh, the uterus, as you can see on the upper left uh, panel here. This is a 4D ultrasound We're showing that there is uh, some mucus uh, polyp which needs to be removed if we are going to uh, if we want to be successful again uh, the cyst may be seen and then we would decide if we are going to aspirate the cyst or leave it uh, all together is it a simple cyst is it an endometrial cyst and so on and then on the lower right panel uh, uh, this ultrasound can give us an idea about the utero cervical angle as we will see later when we do our embryo transfer is it going to be simple and smooth or do we expect having uh, complications there and then finally uh, we uh, look at the ovaries and uh, do the antral follicle count as you can see here to see uh, if uh, this lady is going to uh, be a good responder or a hyper responder or a poor responder for that matter. Antral follicle count, of course, should be done at the beginning of the cycle, uh, but the other uh, um, uh, findings can be seen at any time of the cycle. Then if uh, everything is fine and we decide to do, uh, start our uh, IVF or ICSI, uh, we, do, we start stimulating uh, the ovaries of the lady. So there are different stimulation protocols. Of course, at the beginning, IVF was done in a natural cycle. But then people uh, started to use clomiphene citrate, uh, HMG only, and then uh, currently uh, the two important protocols are either the long agonist protocol or the antagonist protocol. And of course, there is also the double stimulation protocol or the so-called Shanghai protocol. So let's discuss them one by one. As said at the beginning, Stepto and Edwards had tried clomiphene citrate and had tried uh, FSH preparations or uh, let's say HMG preparations and they were not successful. And uh, the first baby was born from a natural unstimulated cycle. And as I said before, how was this done? The patient was admitted to the hospital, LH was measured in urine and then every three hours and when it started to rise, as we can see here, defined rise of LH, if the LH uh, uh, reach a level which is 50% uh, over the, the mean of the previous three readings, then this was called the defined rise of urinary LH, and oocyte retrieval was done 24 hours afterwards. Uh, today, we do our ovum collection to 32 to 36 hours after HCG injection. So this is uh, but here we wait until the LH goes up, so there is a gap of about uh, uh, six to eight hours, as you can see here. 
uh, today of course we uh, do uh, ultrasound monitoring uh, we follow the monitoring with ultrasound so if we are uh, actually doing a natural cycle or an unsimulated cycle we'll find a single uh, follicle as you can see here uh, after the birth of Louise Brown and three uh, other babies, uh, the Australians said, well, we are going to do IVF using the clomiphene citrate cycle. They said, we have always been using clomiphene citrate to, to do ov ovarian induction for patients, and they produce uh, more than one follicle, so our chance will be better. Uh, this was a debate because Stepton and Edwards had said that the endometrium uh, shows the changes which are unfavorable for embryo transfer but of course the Australians said why we are good giving clomiphene citrate to people in uh, uh, just uh, uh, natural cycles and they become pregnant anyway see how the Australians started to do this and this is how they would do it you will see the patient at the beginning and that time the ultrasound was again a primitive but today if somebody is going to do to use the clomiphene citrate uh, protocol uh, then he would uh, see the patient at the beginning of the cycle do an ultrasound then give the clomiphene citrate 100 milligrams per day for five days or sometimes 150 milligrams for five days and then do the ultrasound when we have a follicle of about 18 millimeters we would give the hcg and do the OSAT pick up 36 hours after that and then after two hours two days three days here 48 hours we would do the embryo transfer and the monitoring, as I said, would be done with ultrasound, but also we can measure a serum uh, E2. And as I said, the such retrieval would be done between 32 and 36 hours. Uh, I would like to say here that very few people use these protocols nowadays. Uh, the um, unstimulated cycle or the clomiphene citrate cycle, uh, because they are associated with low uh, success rates. Uh, but uh, by 1981, the Americans started to use a different stimulation protocol. They started using HMG, which, as we remember, is a preparation containing uh, FSH and LH. The pools at that time contained 75 international units of each of these hormones, and they started stimulating patients with HMG, and they achieved the first pregnancy, as I say, in 19. 81. So the first people who achieved the pregnancy were Stepton and Edwards in the UK in 1978, then the Australians in 1980 using clomiphene citrate, then the Americans in 1981 uh, using uh, HMG. At that time, I was privileged by working at King's College Hospital. I was in charge of the infertility clinic uh, at King's College Hospital uh, in uh, uh, London, uh, United Kingdom. I was a uh, working uh, under the guidance of Professor Stuart Campbell, the godfather of ultrasonography. And at that time, we had started looking at uh, uh, the follicle of ultrasound. So from the beginning, we did our stimulation using HMG protocol. So the patient would come and start at HMG at uh, day three. At that time, we used to give her uh, clomiphene citrate. But this is the third protocol, which is the M uh, HMG only protocol. So we would see the patient on day three, and give her HMG or FSH and follow up uh, with ultrasound again and sometimes using uh, serum E2 also uh, until uh, we think that follicles are mature we give the SCG and then we do our OSAT retrieval again 32 to 36 hours after the SCG injection uh, and as I say, uh, when we do this, we have multiple follicular development. Uh, if you're uh, in unstimulated cycle, we will have one of all sides, usually. Uh, if we give clomiphene citrate, you will have two or three. But if you give HMG or FSH, this is what you would expect in a good responding patient. Seven, eight uh, all sides, maybe even in each uh, ovary. Uh, but at that time, people started to uh, worry about something, the premature LH rise. They said, well, uh, if the, prima the LH rise would rise, we will end up by having uh, all site premature uh, luteinization of uh, our uh, follicle. We would lose the oocyte. We would not be able to collect all the oocytes. So what did the drug companies do? Well, they came up with the NRH agonists. Agonists are 
substance uh, compounds which are similar to GnRH. We can see here at the upper panel the GnRH, as we remember, it is a decapeptide, 10 amino acids. And then they started to play around with amino acid number 6, which is a glycine, producing different compounds which have the capacity of uh, suppressing uh, uh, the uh, pituitary rather than stimulating the pituitary. Well, actually, it produces some flare-up stimulation at the very beginning, a slight stimulation for two or three days, followed by uh, depression uh, or um, of the function of the pituitary. Therefore, you would cancel all the hormones of the body. You're not uh, afraid of having a premature LH rise. And then you would do the stimulation uh, on your own, uh, like this. And the first protocol which was used was the GnRH long protocol. Long uh, luteal protocol. So the patient would be seen, uh, is seen on day 21 of the previous cycle, and then GnRH agonist is started. Uh, until she gets her period, then at that time uh, the dose of GnRH is halved, um, and then uh, H uh, HMG or FSH uh, would start to be uh, given on day 3, and then the follow up will be done again with ultrasound, uh, with or without uh, estradiol, until we have. Uh, what we think are mature follicles, give the HCG, and we do the oocyte correction uh, 36, uh, 32 to 36 hours afterwards. Uh, but uh, some, this, of course, uh, protocol is very long and uh, it takes a long time, so people started to uh, use a different protocol, the so-called short protocol. Short protocol is what we see the patient at the beginning of the cycle, and she would start taking the GnRH from the beginning of the cycle, and then from day three she would she would take also the FSH or HMG, and we'll continue the GnRH agonist together with the FSH or, uh, and uh, or HMG until the follicles are uh, mature as we think they are mature, and then we give HCG and do the OSAT correction again at 32 to 36 hours afterwards. But then, if you do this in some patients, uh, this would be too much for them. For example, patients after a certain age, or patients which we call uh, poor responders. You give them the GnRH agonist, and then you discover that they, uh, this has suppressed the response very much, and there is no, uh, you give FSH and LH, it does not work. So what people have been suggesting, again, the so-called the very short protocol or the flare-up protocol. So we make use of the flare-up uh, property of the GnRH agonist. We give the GnRH agonist for three days at the beginning of the cycle just to take this flare-up. So it, we will take the stimulation, but we will not take the suppression. So three days from day two to three, day five, for example, as you can see here, or day four or day three to five. And then at the same time, you start giving FSH or LH, follow uh, with your usual uh, follow-up with uh, ultrasound, with and without estradiol, and then uh, when the follicles um, reach the optimum size, or we may think, the embryo, uh, the follicles are mature enough. We give the SCG and do the oocyte correction. Uh, this is the uh, this was the agonist protocol. Because after that, the drug companies came up with the antagonists, GnRH antagonists. What did they do? They said we now have introduced new compounds. These antagonists do not have this flare up. Uh, property at the beginning of the cycle. They will start separating from uh, the time when you give your antagonists. And there are different uh, compounds on the market. I'm not going to, uh, to but we, the important ones are the uh, Cetorelix and the Ganyrelix. And this is the difference between the GnRH agonist and the antagonist. As you can see here uh, in the yellow uh, line, uh, the agonists are characterized by giving you a flare-up for two or three days at the beginning, followed by the depression, the suppression of, uh, of uh, the pituitary. Uh, but uh, if you give the antagonist from the beginning, you will start having your uh, suppression. And this is the antagonist protocol. So the lady would come at the beginning of the cycle. She would be stimulated from day three with FSH or HMG. And then uh, by day six, seven, or eight, we would start giving her the antagonist. There are two ways of giving the antagonist. Either we give it every day, as we can see here, uh, quarter milligram, 0.25 milligram subcutaneously per day, starting from day uh, 
8, for example, as you can see here, but as you can see in the lower panel, it's any day from 6 to 8. But some people came after that and said, well, uh, we can uh, be more flexible. We were really uh, going to start our GnRH antagonist uh, when our, uh, the leading follicle will be 14 millimeters in diameter, which is a more logic way. There is another method of giving the GnRH in one bolus, 3 milligrams on day 6 or 7 or 8 again, uh, but most of the people would use the daily uh, antagonist protocol. Because finally, we have another protocol, the so-called double stimulation protocol. And as you can see here, there are two uh, OPU, o -O -site, uh, um, ovum pickup. Uh, and this protocol was introduced in China. And you know, the, it's called the Shanghai protocol, but uh, people use it uh, around the world, particularly if the patient is coming for um, fertility preservation. For example, in cases of cancer, a young patient has been diagnosed with cancer and we need to collect the oocytes quickly. Uh, so what we do, we give the HMG or the FSH and then we stimulate uh, either uh, by HCG or GnRH agonists and then we do the oocyte uh, pickup and collect some oocytes and then uh, let her wait for two or three days and then start simulating again with HMG and do another uh, HCG injection and collect some more oocytes. As I said, this is done in cases of cancer. It is also done on patients with poor response, trying to get as much oocytes from the same uh, cycle. Of course, we cannot do embryo transfer in the same cycle uh, like this. We have to wait. Uh, if the patient uh, has cancer, she will have her treatment uh, for cancer, and then she will come after that uh, to have the embryo transfer done. Uh, and also, if she is a poor responder, she will have to wait until she gets another period, and then we will do uh, freezing, and we will uh, replace our embryos in uh, uh, um, um, uh, a subsequent cycle. Okay, for stimulation protocols. So uh, either we uh, we can use different sorts of uh, stimulation protocols. As I said, the most commonly used ones are the long protocol, the long agonist protocol, and the antagonist protocol. Uh, okay, so when our follicle, we when we think our follicle is mature, we will do the triggering with HCG. So when do we do this? Uh, we do most of the people would do this when we have at least two follicles of 18 millimeters in diameter. So as you can see in the left panel, uh, we give 5,000 or 10,000 international units, and then uh, um, uh, collect do the collection uh, 32 to 36 hours afterwards. Uh, but it is also reassuring if we can see, uh, and as we can see on the right panel, that the endometrium is uh, showing good response. The trilaminar. A pattern, as you can see here, which is characteristic of a good estradiol response, and uh, hope, uh, preferably also with an individual thickness of at least seven millimeters. Uh, sometimes, if we are faced with something uh, like this uh, picture, this lady uh, is going to develop uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. She's developing too many uh, follicles, as you can see, and this usually happens with patients with polycystic ovary syndrome. And if you're doing uh, measuring estradiol at that time, you will discover that estradiol has gone uh, very high. So what do we do? We can, of course, cancel the cycle. But another alternative is instead of giving her HCG, we would give her GnRH. As we know, GnRH, which is produced by the hypothalamus, stimulate the pituitary to produce its own FSH and LH. So if you give GnRH, you are actually stimulating the pituitary to produce its own LH. So instead of giving HCG, you give GnRH. It is a milder form of stimulation, and then you collect the oocytes, and then you don't put them back. You freeze them, and then you would put them back in a subsequent cycle, trying to prevent the development of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Because if you put them back in the same cycle, uh, by giving GnRH, the luteal phase is not usually very uh, good. So people sometimes do intense support of the luteal phase. They would increase the dose of 
progesterone they give in the second part of the in the luteal phase uh, trying to uh, to to improve the luteal phase but the better um, alternative is to freeze all the uh, embryos and then put them back in a subsequent cycle uh, okay so how do we choose our stimulation protocol should we use the agonist protocol or the antagonist protocol now people have been using the entry uh, antibolarin hormone as a guide and also the antral follicle count as a guide so for example if we look at the anti-molarian hormone and mind you these levels are um, um, picomoles per liter they are not nanograms per milliliter but anyway uh, we can convert them uh, into a nanogram per milliliter if our laboratory is doing a nanogram per milliliter so as you can see depending on the level of AMH uh, if it is for example between 7 and 20 we would expect a normal response in which case we will give a long agonist protocol but if AMH is high this tells us that this lady is going to develop ovarian hyperstimulation so in this case it is preferable to give antagonist protocol and trying to trigger with GnRH agonist in order to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and maybe replace our embryos in a subsequent cycle as I said uh, just now but if the AMH is low say below 7 then we would expect a reduced response this patient would be a poor respondent and, and so on uh, so in this case maybe we should do the flare-up protocol in order to take advantage of the little stimulation that would happen at the beginning of uh, the cycle and if the response is very poor so maybe we would think that there's no point of wasting the money to uh, stimulate the lady with very high doses of uh, HMG or FSH if at the end she's going to divert to, to, to give us uh, one two or three sites at the most so maybe we would do the modified cycle or the the clomiphene citrate uh, maybe or uh, to give a small dose of HMG the so-called modified natural cycle so uh, as I said the two most important protocols the most commonly used protocols are either the long agonist protocol in the lower panel or the antagonist protocol the long agonist protocol if we can uh, say again starts day 21 of the previous cycle we give GnRH one milligram a day until the lady gets her period she would come she would start the FSH or HMG usually three ampoules 221 international unit and at the same time we would uh, diminish the dose of GnRH agonist to half the dose 0.5 milligram per day and carry on until we have 18 millimeter follicles we give the SCG and then we do the oocyte collection in the upper panel is the antagonist protocol so the lady comes at the beginning of the cycle from day one or day two she will start having her FSH uh, three ampoules a day again 225 international units and then uh, it will be seen uh, like day six and if we have a follicle of 14 millimeters we will start giving out the GnRH antagonist uh, 0.25 milligram every day uh, for six day or until we do the HCG and this is the individualized protocol as you can see so uh, of course uh, when we see the lady on day six uh, or after a few days of stimulation we may like to increase the dose of FSH or diminish it uh, according to the response if we think that this lady is going to develop hyperstimulation maybe we will diminish the dose of FSH HMG and if we think that she's not responding properly we may like to increase uh, the dose uh, beyond three ampoules a day to make it four or five ampoules uh, per day and as said we do the OSAT retrieval 32 to 36 hours after triggering with HCG so how do we do the OSAT retrieval at the beginning OSAT was retrieved by uh, laparoscopy as said uh, but then uh, during uh, the beginning there was no vagina ultrasound so when uh, we started as I said uh, IVF program in 1981 at King's College Hospital we were uh, one of the first uh, um, three uh, centers in the world who try, uh, started by doing transabdominal ultrasound we go 
transabdominal, transurethral with a full bladder, and we would go and collect uh, the oocytes uh, transabdominally. Then came for a short period a uh, method of transurethral oocyte collection, uh, and then finally uh, today after the introduction of transvaginal ultrasound in 1986, now everybody does the oocyte retrieval uh, by transabdominal route because it is uh, the most uh, easy and most successful uh, way of collecting the oocytes. So this is was the beginning when Mr. Stepto started the beginning. Oocyte was collected by laparoscopy, as we can see here. So what he would see under the laparoscope, he would see a follicle like this, and then uh, the needle would be inserted in the follicle and aspirated. Uh, what came after that, as I said, uh, what we used to do at King's College Hospital is to do the transabdominal ultrasound guided oocyte collection, as you can see here. Uh, uh, with a full bladder, we would go and do the oocyte collection. But today, um, everybody in the world uh, does oocyte collection by the transvaginal uh, way, as we can see uh, here in these uh, pictures and diagrams. Uh, we may like to use a suction pump. Uh, the suction pump controls the uh, aspiration pressure. Uh, so uh, you can uh, use it uh, by uh, control it by the uh, by the foot or even by uh, by hand and the follicle is uh, aspirated as you can see here so uh, this is the vacuum controller and uh, the um, uh, needle uh, with the echogenic tip uh, which will show on ultrasound the aspiration needle and if you uh, the vacuum controller is going to be worked up suction will be uh, done and the uh, all the fluid is going to be collected in this test tube which is going to be changed every time it is full because a simpler way is just to use a syringe and needle and this is what we used to do at King's College Hospital in the very beginning and what uh, we are still doing uh, up to now it is a simpler procedure it is a cheaper procedure uh, and so on but it depends on what you have been used to do so this is a needle inside the follicle during oocyte retrieval. We take the, folli the, uh, the follicle fluid and we give it to our colleague in the laboratory, the embryologist. So he or she, she will look under the dissecting microscope, as you can see here. Dissecting microscope uh, it gives you um, magnification between, I think, between 10 and 40, for example. You don't have a very, you don't need a very big, uh, magnification because because the oocyte as you can see here resembles really a fried egg if you can see the oocyte is the largest for uh, cell in the body it is anything between 80 uh, microns and 150 microns so it's say let's say 100 microns and it is surrounded by the granulosa cells all other cells in the body have are about 10 microns so this is how it looks under the microscope and if you look carefully at, at uh, the uh, uh, 10 hour, you will find that uh, there is a first polar body which has been extruded, which means that this oocyte is a M2 oocyte, a metaphase 2 oocyte, which means that this oocyte uh, contains only 23 chromosomes because the other chromosomes are in the first polar body located at position 10 uh, hours, if you can see here. At the same time, we will ask the, husband, the male consort, the husband, to produce a semen sample, and our colleague in the laboratory is going to prepare it, as we said before. We cannot take the sperm as it is and put it on top of the oocyte. Uh, after preparing uh, the sperm, then insemination is done. Uh, a drop of semen containing like 100,000 uh, spermatozoa is put uh, on top of uh, the, the oocyte, site as you can see here in one of these uh, culture media um, dishes uh, but if uh, the semen is not good then we may decide to ICSI intracytoplasmic sperm injection in which case we will need micro manipulation uh, equipment and this is the micro uh, manipulation 
uh, equipment with the embryologist sitting there. Uh, what uh, she or she is doing is that uh, they are there are joysticks, and these joysticks, one centimeter in the joystick of movement, will translate into one micron under the microscope. And this is a so-called inverted microscope, meaning that the light is coming from above, not from below, and uh, the objectives are from below. And he is looking there and trying to do the intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And if you look carefully, this is what uh, it looks like on top of our uh, culture dish. On the left side, there is the so-called holding pipette, and on the right side, there is the injection pipette, or the other way around. And this is how it looks under the microscope. On the left side is the holding pipette. It's a class pipette, which is done in a special way to uh, slightly, with a slight aspiration, you would fix your oocyte, and then from the right side, uh, one uh, spermatozoon is injected, as you can see here. And as you can see again, the first polar body is at position 12. And as said before, sometimes the husband is azospermic. And there are two forms of azospermia. There is the so-called obstructive azospermia and the non-obstructive azospermia. On the left side, we have obstructive azospermia. Meaning what? Meaning that the testis is functioning properly. But there is an obstruction in the way. So the husband, is, the, 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 the person is azospermic. But if you take uh, uh, some uh, spermatozoa from his testes with a needle, so you do testicular sperm aspiration, you will find good spermatozoa. But on the right side, we have a man with non-obstructive azosperma, meaning that he is azospermic not because he has an obstruction, no, but because the testis is not functioning properly from the very beginning. So this case we like to obtain a piece of tissue so we do testicular sperm extraction with an e t e s e not t s a so this is testicular sperm extraction and we take this um, piece of tissue this uh, testicular uh, sample and we look into it for any spermatozoa hopefully we find a good number to be used for the ICSI. Then, um, after the insemination is done, either by IVF or by ICSI, uh, the inseminated oocytes are put in a CO2 incubator. Why is it CO2 incubator? Because under 5% of CO2 in air, uh, if we use the appropriate culture medium, we can control the pH at 7.4. As we know, 7.4 is the proper pH for all uh, metabolic uh, and enzymatic uh, reactions in the human body. This is how it was made. This is how it was created. So by keeping our uh, CO2 at 5% and the temperature at 37 degrees, we can guarantee that the uh, pH will remain at uh, 7.4. At the same time, this incubator has to be um, uh, humidified at the proper humidity because we don't want the osmolar pressure to change. So the culture medium must have the proper osmolarity which is 280 milliosmol per liter and the proper pH which is 7.4 and the proper temperature which is 37 degrees centigrade. If this is, and if this, if this is the case, uh, by the following day we have a look and we find that our oocyte has been uh, fertilized. And where a fertilized oocytes, as we can see here, contains two pronuclei. Two nuclei, we call them the pronuclei. And the uh, uh, nuclei contain nucleoli. And as you can see, that nucleoli inside of each nucleus is properly arranged in front of the other group. At the same time, now we have two uh, polar bodies because with fertilization the second polar body is extruded and after 24 hours as you can see here we find that our oocyte has been fertilized and it is uh, a pro two pro nuclear stage as we call it 
some people call it also a zygote. Then, uh, after 48 hours of insemination, we will hand a two cell embryo or a four cell embryo. Uh, by day three, we will have five, six, or eight cell embryo, and sometimes ten cell embryo. And, and after this, it will become a morula and then a blastocyst. As we can see here again, um, upper left, we have a 2PN uh, embryo, meaning uh, two pronuclear stage, which, as I said, how it happens after 24 hours, 18 to 24 hours. Uh, by uh, 48 hours, we'll have two to four cells, which we cannot see, we should not see on this picture. But on day three, we will have an eight cell embryo by day four we will have a compacted embryo or a morula compacted morula the cells the so-called blastomeres they start to fuse together as you can see on the upper right uh, photo uh, because they stick together and you cannot really separate it's difficult to separate them at that stage and then lower left we have a morula again on day four because by day five the embryo will start to develop a cavity and becomes a blastocyst and some of the cells are going to make the inner cell mass for wh from which the embryo is going to develop and the others are going to uh, form the membranes but mind you up to this stage to day five the zona pellucida is still there because by day six hatching of the blastocyst happens the blastocyst starts to hatch outside its cover of the outside of the zona pellucida as you can see here on day six a hatching blastocyst because only after this hatching can the blastocyst stick to the wall of the uterus so having uh, seen a successful fertilization we choose our embryos that we want to replace and we replace them by embryo transfer as we can see here we can do this after two days or three days uh, or five days or six days actually or we can also do it on uh, after four days we can do it any time any time between day two and day six uh, the more you leave it in the incubator um, the more you will have natural selection so uh, many uh, some not all embryos will uh, may have the, the capacity of uh, growing until day five or day six so uh, depending on the patient on, on the conditions and on the laboratory you may decide to do your embryo transfer on day two or day three or day four or day five or day six and this is how uh, things are done we like to deposit our embryos away from the fundus we don't want to go to the fundus injure the fundus and then having some bleeding inside the uterus and so on so it's good to remain away from the fundus uh, by one or two centimeters and then do the embryo deposition uh, um, in this uh, and this is one of the catheters used for embryo transfer there are many catheters some of them are soft some of them more are more firm some of them consist of uh, are made specifically for difficult transfers and so on uh, some of them have a tip uh, uh, which can negotiate its way in the internal os and so on uh, and this is another uh, catheter consisting of an outer sheath and an inner sheath so usually the clinician will put the outer sheath and make sure that it's inside the uterine cavity and then ask the embryologist to come and bring the inner sheath with the embryos and then try to deposit it uh, inside uh, it is always better to do uh, our ultrasound transfer under ultrasound uh, our embryo transfer under ultrasound guidance as you can see here we can see where we are and we can see where we are depositing our embryos and then having done this we would give uh, the patient a luteal uh, support uh, which consists of progesterone uh, really we would give our progesterone until 12 weeks gestation some people do it uh, give it for less than this some people give it for a longer time but the uh, accepted wisdom is to give it for 12 weeks uh, because as we know uh, the corpus luteum between the weeks 6 and 10 starts to 
diminished uh, in product producing uh, progesterone and the placenta has not yet uh, been fully functioning so there is a little critical period there so we want to bypass this critical period until 12 weeks of gestation so what do we do what do we give we can give micronized progesterone by oral tablets or we can give it by vaginal route or we can give it by rectal route even uh, the americans prefer giving progesterone intramuscularly and there are also vaginal progesterone gel preparations and in fact there is also a vaginal progesterone ring which people do not think is a good idea in this case you don't want to put something mechanical in the vagina uh, at that time uh, and as you can see here these are the micronized progesterone because progesterone uh, if taken by mouth is going to be uh, destroyed in the gastrointestinal tract so you have to give it in a micronized form which is bypassed the stomach and then uh, be released in the intestines or uh, the needles as i said and as you can see in the lower right panel uh, vaginal gel is being deposited or a vaginal ovule of micronized progesterone also so there are different ways of giving the luteal phase support 16 days after oocyte retrieval we do our beta hcg test to see if the lady is pregnant and if she is pregnant after two more weeks uh, we will start seeing uh, the um, pregnancy sac and uh, uh, with the embryo and uh, the yolk sac actually which you can see here this uh, rounded little black thing inside the pregnancy sac so how successful is the procedure now these are the statistics from the uh, SART, Society of Assisted Production Technology, which is part of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, for the national uh, results. Uh, it takes a, a long time to uh, get all the results from the, from the country, but these are the latest available results. Anyway, and as you can see, pregnancy per transfer is 35.8. So it's really roughly one in three. This is what patients should expect, really, if they are in the average age between say 20 and, uh, and uh, um, 35 uh, of course the success rate is more than this uh, or less than this depending on one how you express your success rate is it per start the cycle is it per transfer is it uh, are you talking about live birth rate or are you talking about clinical pregnancy rate? are you talking about uh, biochemical pregnancy rate so but to be um, um, more uh, uh, in general so it's about one in three and if we repeat it three times it's about two in three so there are patients who do not become become pregnant after that and this is another subject uh, repeated implantation failure and what you would do about this is requires a lecture of its own and of course the results depend on the age as you can see here, if you're talking about uh, women less than 35 years of age, so you'd expect it one in three, as I said. But with age, the possibility of pregnancy and the live birth rate diminishes. For example, a lady of 44 years, she would expect something like 2% live birth per treatment because this is what is important for the couple. They want to go back with a living baby. They don't want to have a positive pregnancy test and then having a miscarriage. So what's really important, we should always be talking about life per treat, per treatment cycle. Because, as I said, uh, there are different ways of expressing success. As you can see, we can be talking about biochemical pregnancy rate. The pregnancy is positive after a few days, the lady has her period. Or is it a clinical pregnancy rate? And then, uh, which will end up in miscarriage. Or does it progress? To 24 weeks for example we can see a nice uh, uh, fetus on ultrasound uh, but what is important of course and they put in red here is the live birth rate and are you talking about live birth rate per started cycle or are you talking per oocyte collection because not all started cycles continue till the end you may be starting your cycle and then discovering the patient is not responding properly so you cancel the cycle and you don't count it in your statistics but you should so are you talking about per starter cycle 
or for the oocyte collection because sometimes we don't have fertilization there's fertilization failure the laboratory says spermid oocytes were bad sperm was bad we didn't have any embryos so we cancel the embryo transfer so are you talking per cycle started or per site collection or by embryo transfer and finally nowadays we are starting to talk about cumulative pregnancy rate because if we have we don't like to put more than uh, uh, one or two uh, embryos per patient for fearing of multiple pregnancy so uh, you can collect a big number of both sites sometimes 15 20 and more than this in some patients and some young patients so you're not going to put everything of course so you put two or three and she becomes pregnant and she comes back and she becomes pregnant or maybe she does not become pregnant on the first cycle and then uh, you put some more and then finally you get uh, pregnancy so you want to uh, know what is the cumulative pregnancy rate or the cumulative rate of live birth per cycle started this is really the ideal way of expressing the results the ideal and honest way of expressing the results cumulative rate of live birth per cycle started there are some complications which are uh, which possibly can happen with IVF we mentioned ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome uh, we also uh, can have a multiple pregnancy if we're putting too many embryos. Uh, thromboembolism is always a possibility in patients receiving the DHMG, particularly if uh, the patient remains in bed after embryo transfer, which is something we always discourage and tend the people not to do. But many patients tend, they think that they, by staying in bed, uh, they give a better chance for the embryo to uh, um, implant which is of course uh, wrong and of course the psychological load as said before uh, that people have to be psychologically prepared for um, not becoming pregnant otherwise they would uh, go into depression and uh, worse than depression and finally the economic burden who is going to pay because people these uh, techniques are expensive and people can pay all this money and then finally not becoming pregnant or they may not have the money in the first place so who is going to pay for it is the insurance company going to pay for it which the normally is not the case or is the government you going to uh, um, pay for it or are the going people going to borrow money and then uh, have to uh, give them back whether they become pregnant or not and here's the hyperstimulation syndrome as i said it is more common in patients with polycystic ovary syndrome and what is the mechanism the mechanism is that uh, these patients have increased levels of vegf vascular endothelial growth factor which leads to vascular permeability so the fluid inside the circulation leaves the circulation and goes to the third compartment goes into the peritoneal cavity it goes into the pleural uh, cavity uh, or in other places in the body giving anasarca so uh, with this the blood is going to be viscous and people may have microthrombi and uh, as you can see uh, from here so the treatment is really trying to put back this fluid inside the circulation by giving something which has high molecular uh, uh, weight like albumin for example or different sorts of starches which are going to raise the osmotic pressure inside the circulation inside the blood vessels in and try to attract this fluid again inside the circulation at the same time we would aspirate the this fluid from the the abdominal cavity uh, through transvaginal ultrasound and uh, then to relieve the patient from uh, the pressure symptoms sometimes the, the water is too much they cannot breathe so we do this at the same time uh, putting in may but yeah taking into consideration that we are aspirating fluid which contains a lot of albumin so the lady has to be compensated by giving albumin uh, in the form of intravenous um, or uh, to eat um, um, broth and uh, uh, a diet which is um, contains a lot of proteins and albumins because the other complication of course is multiple pregnancy well this is the septuplet which were, who were born in Alexandria in 2010. Uh, it was not a case of IVF. It was a case of it was a case of stim HMG stimulation, 
and it did not happen in Alexandria, it happened in a different city. But we ended up by having the patient in our hospital coming at 28 weeks to have a baby. So the seven babies are living uh, because she was pregnant before. She had three children before, but they were all girls. So she wanted to have uh, one more boy. She ended up by having three more boys and four more girls. And because multiple pregnancy is associated with complications, there are maternal complications and the fetal complications. Maternal complications, anemia, polyhydramnios, preeclampsia, preterm birth, delivery by cesarean section, postpartum hemorrhage, all these are possible complications. And the fetal complications can end up by miscarriage or malpresentations, malpresenta previa, abrupt placenta, premature rupture of the membranes, prematurity, they go, they, are, they cannot continue all, to the, all of them until the end of the pregnancy, prematurity, they need incubators and they may not survive, there is a possibility of having um, um, different uh, neurological complications in premature babies, umbilical cord prosep can also happen, intrauterine growth retardation, and finally congenital anomalies, they are all complications of multiple pregnancy, this is why there's, it is always wise not to put more, more than two embryos per embryo transfer, it depends of course if this patient is young, if this patient has been pregnant before, if the patient has been trying for IVF for many times and she did not become pregnant. So there are many reasons for, there are many um, things to put into consideration when deciding the number of oocytes, uh, the number of embryos to put back, uh, but certainly not to put too many for fear of having multiple pregnancy. Because we can always freeze the other embryos. We put two embryos and we freeze the rest. We can freeze the embryos, of course, but we can also freeze the oocytes for uh, young women who want to uh, pursue a career and then come back and have a baby. Uh, they really have to do this early because usually these people come in the late 30s and try to freeze their oocytes, so in which case the response is not that, that good. And of course, also we do a sperm, we can do sperm freezing. Oh, side freezing and sperm freezing are also important for people who, young people who may be affected by cancer. So they will have to have treatment which is going to destroy their uh, pot uh, fertility potential. Therefore, they may like to uh, what we call preserve their fertility, as we call it, fertility preservation. Another um, technique which um, can be done with uh, assisted production is pre implantation genetic testing. Uh, as you can see here, usually it was introduced for uh, genetic diseases. So if people have a certain genetic disease in the family, they would come and they will have IVF. And when the embryo is eight cells, we would take one of the cells and do the diagnosis. And if the genetic disease is not present in this embryo, we put it back. If it is embryo, of course, it will not be put back. But when this technique was used, people started to say, well, we can use this technique for screening. Uh, we are going to do this on all the all embryos so that we can discard the embryos which have a bad carrier type. Uh, this is a long story because it is not a good idea and uh, uh, it would be, it needs again another lecture of its own. Because if you are going to do uh, the pre implantation genetic testing, for example, for preventing uh, mongolism, uh, then we want to make sure that this embryo does not have trisomy 18 or 21 and sometimes 13, the Pato syndrome and all these syndromes. So what is usually done in this technique, if it is done on day three at the eight cell embryo, uh, it is the blastomeres, as we call them, are treated with fluoro in situ hybridization, fish, and uh, what we cannot uh, test all the chromosomes. So usually uh, we test 13, 18, 21, X and Y 
the most common uh, chromosomes with problems with RS. As you can see here, uh, this uh, embryo is a good embryo. We have two of each, two red ones. So each one of takes a color, of course. Because the other technique, the more advanced technique, is to wait until day five, when we have a blastocyst, then take from the true vectoderm. Instead of taking one cell, we would take between five and ten cells, and do the test on five and ten cells. But again, this technique has its problems because you may find that few of the cells have um, problems and few do not have problems, the so-called mosaicism, and then you don't know what to do. Shall we put them back? Shall we not put them back? Because people used to discard them and then uh, discover that you are only getting grave of embryos which end up by being normal babies. So there is a lot of controversy regarding this technique. Because when this technique is done, there are more advanced methods of checking. We do not check three or five chromosomes as said before. Now you can check all the chromosomes. For example, in this case, you have trisomy in uh, chromosome number 10. And this is the amount of DNA present in each chromosome. And as you can see, when you come to chromosome 10, you find that there is a lot of DNA, meaning that there is trisomy at this, uh, in this chromosome. And then at the end, the X chromosome is doubled again because this is a female uh, embryo. Uh, as said before, there are two other techniques that people uh, have been doing in the past. Uh, when IVF was started, uh, it was done for people with blocked tubes. But then Dr. Ricardo Ash from California said, well, I have patients with patent tubes, but they're not becoming pregnant. So what I'm going to do is to collect the oocytes, usually at that time by laparoscopy. This was 1984, by laparoscopy. And then I will have the sperm prepared. I put them together and put them at the same laparoscopy in the fallopian tube. So I'll mix them put them together as you can see on the left side he's putting back the oocytes together with the sperm in the fallopian tube and this technique was called gift gamete intrafallopian transfer people told him but you can never be sure that these oocytes will be fertilized maybe the sperm is not covered she looks good but does not fertilize the egg why don't you keep them outside until they fertilize and after 24 hours, you put back the zygotes. So, this is the so-called zygote intrafallopian transfer, ZIFT for short, which has also be, has been done in the past. But of course, it is too clumsy. And this was really in the time when oocyte collection was done by laparoscopy. So, it was going to have, have be laparoscopy anyway. But today, of course, we do our ovum collection with uh, vaginal ultrasound. So there is no point of doing all these heroic techniques if we can achieve uh, the same results or even better by uh, doing it uh, vaginally. There are, of course, ethical issues surrounding assisted reproduction. For example, what would you do for supernumerary embryos? The patient has produced many embryos. She has used some of them. She became pregnant. And there are some extra embryos which she doesn't want. Should we throw them away? Should we use them for uh, research work? What kind uh, of preservation of embryos and gametes? If we are going to preserve our embryos or gametes, uh, how long would you keep them in the laboratory? Can people come back after 10 years and say, uh, we want them? Okay, but if the lady has been divorced or her husband is dead, is she allowed to put back her embryos? Are they her property? Or is it the property, of course, under the Egyptian law? Uh, the patient uh, has to be married in a current pregnancy and a current uh, relationship. She cannot have this done if she is divorced or her uh, husband is dead. Uh, fetal reduction. What happens if we have a three a multiple pregnancy? Should we aspirate some of them, which we do, but in some countries this is forbidden? Choice of gender. Can we do pre implantation genetic testing just to see uh, whether it is a boy or a girl, because people come back and say, well, we want to have a boy, we want to have a girl. Under our law, uh, if 
the couple have two babies of the same gender, they can have uh, pre um, they can have this technique done, but not less than two. Uh, but people may come and ask, well, I want a baby with blue eyes. I want a baby with higher uh, intelligence. So what should be done? Are we propagating a weaker race? For example, men who are isospermic, many of them have problems, have gene genetic problems. They have the uh, AZF gene uh, the, or the, uh, the DAS gene deleted in isospermia. So these people were not meant to have children. Now they have been treated with ICSI and they have children. And if they have boys, are these boys going to carry the same problem with them? We are waiting to see because ICSI has started uh, only 26, 27 years ago. So we really uh, need to know what's going to happen. Are these babies going to have the same problem? So are we propagating a weaker race? Uh, gamete and embryo donation. If a woman doesn't have oocytes, she is as premature uh, menopause. Can she borrow uh, oocytes from her sister or from somebody she doesn't know? Well, under Egyptian law, this is not allowed. Uh, gamete donation, sperm donation, or egg donation is not allowed. Uh, it's not allowed in Sunni countries, but it is allowed in. Shia countries, for example, and in different other countries of the world, of course. Surrogacy. Uh, the woman does not have a uterus. So can she have her oocyte fertilized by her husband's sperm and put in the uterus of another lady until delivery? And then she, she would have her baby again? Because sometimes this ended up by the uh, carrier woman saying that I cannot get rid of the baby, it is my baby and I will keep it. Uh, stem cell research can we use uh, the inner cell mass of the uh, uh, of the blastocyst to do research on stem cells or for that matter to do cloning, therapeutic cloning or reproductive cloning. Therapeutic cloning means cloning of tissues. Uh, we clone uh, somebody who has uh, liver problems, so can we use these um, cells to produce hepatic cells for him, to treat him? Uh, maybe it is accepted, but can we use them to clone a whole body to produce? Uh, and of course, there are many ethical issues related to assisted production. Because finally, our ultimate aim is to bring happiness to couples and our main motto should be primum non nocere which translates in English in first of all daughter. Uh, with this I come to the end of my presentation and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and I would like to remind you that this has been part four of a four parts presentation. First part was about male factor in infertility, second part was about ovarian factor Part 3 about the cervical, tubal, uterine, peritoneal factors in infertility and on, on uh, unexplained infertility. And finally, this part was about assisted reproduction.